Welcome to Auto Shop Showcase with Gary Gunn. Today's guests are Craig and Chris from AutoFlow. Welcome, folks, to another event called Showcase. We're showcasing, uh, wow, it's hard to explain everything that AutoFlow does, but we have two experts with us here today, and that kind of leaves me out. So we've got Chris and we've got Craig. And so if they can't answer the questions I'm going to ask them, shame on them. So if you've got ears, you want to be listening and you want to take a pencil and write some things down because this is going to really be meaningful for your auto repair shop success. All right. First segment here is really a question that I've always wanted to ask Craig and, and ask Chris here. And it's why does an auto repair shop owner need to take a serious look at auto flow? Chris, what, what would you tell them if you're in an elevator speech and you're going one floor to the next and you've got two seconds, three seconds? Gary, I'm an auto repair shop owner. And I wanted to present transparency in transaction with my customer. And that's really what AutoFlow allows us to do is create transparency in a non-tangible. So when we go on Amazon and that customer is able to go look at that widget or gadget they're going to go to buy, they know that it's going to be $400 or $500. When your people at the front counter call them and tell them that they're going to come buy a, a, a flux capacitor, they have no idea what it is. So I think a digital inspection truly does allow for a transparent interaction with your customer so they can see some of the things that they're buying. They're maybe not going to understand what they are, Gary, but they're going to have a tangible now to put with something that's always been very intangible in our industry. I think transparency is something that we've always preached, and I think that something like AutoFlow, a tool like this, is very important to creating that transparent nature with yeah, your customer. Yeah, you, you, you used a lot of words and they started with a T. So we'll have to remember yes. all those, okay? Yes. So Craig, what would you say? Uh, piggybacking on what Chris says, I think we're at an interesting phase for the industry where speed of service and client experience are both converging into new importance. Technology is required for this. And I think the shop owners that should be paying attention to auto flow are in good hands with us because we can do two things. There's two, two types of shop owners that we would engage with primarily, Gary. And one is somebody who's completely new to embracing technology and our team of onboarding trainers and experts in the industry, as well as the tool, will assist them in all the steps to get proficient with it. And then there's also the people who are proficient in technology and want something that's going to set them apart from basic systems that may dabble in some of the features that we do, but we focus on those things with such a, an intensity that we can do some things that will allow you to stand out from the other shops in your town. Well, that's segment number one, folks, and we'll come back with segment two here in just a few minutes. All right, folks, we're back for another segment here, and we're not going to number these segments because we don't know how many we're going to do, so we're just going to leave it open. So here's the segment, and it, let's let's put a title on this is Go for Auto Flow. And we're talking about is go for auto flow, digital auto shop. And Craig, if you were going to take just a couple of minutes and say, gosh, what does a digital auto shop look like? How would you tell somebody about that? Well, you're dealing with multiple variables here. Is obviously any technology and digital is implying a use of technology any time here. You need to have some improvements on key areas, communication, efficiency, productivity, those sort of things should go with any new tool that you bring into a facility. You think of the tool truck, right? That's always coming into the yeah. shop these days. And that technician goes onto a tool truck. They expect what from that new fine tooth ratchet from Snap-on or whoever. And I don't even know how many teeth are in these things these days, Gary, but I do know <laughs> that it's going to make me better at a task that I'm doing already yeah. immediately. And technology can do the same thing, but a lot of people don't necessarily understand where those things come in exactly and they'll just think it's a shiny new thing and they want to embrace it but it solves specific problems very specific problems yeah. uh, pick one right you could pick one thing for me it was the intensity of with which my technicians would be staring at me when i was functioning as a service advisor waiting for me 
to get off the phone with a client to deliver them the details that they need right now to diagnose or inspect a vehicle uh, efficiently. And I can't give them that detail quick enough on a handwritten note or something else while I'm simultaneously doing any, yeah. something with us. Having some digital systems in place where they can see the things that they need properly on a tablet through a login for the vehicle that they're assigned to and working on right now, oh boy, that changes that whole dynamic. Allows me to focus on my customer better and it allows them to not even have to come to the front office anymore for additional details. Uh, little things like that are are the things I encourage people to think about uh, digital processes can solve. Okay, good. Thanks for sharing that. Absolutely. So thank you for that, Craig. I, I love that explanation. And right now I've got a, a specific question for Chris. I don't know what segment this is, but we don't care. We're just going to ask the question. So there, there's something that always comes up when someone wants to do something new, there's a fear factor. So through your years of experience, running your own shop, talking to many other shop owners, and they say, I want to go digital. I'm going to go with auto flow. What's the fear? What do they fear? It's the fear of change, Gary. There's a couple different types of change that we implement in our life. Some of it is the forced change, right? This is, we're bringing a new process and everybody's going to adopt this new technology and we're going to bring tablets into our bays and we're going to now take pictures of the vehicle. And that's a forced change. And that's, you know, there, there's fear in, well, how is this going to go? Well, it's going to make me slower in my job. It's going to, you know, create more problems because I'm really fast at what I can do right now. And then there's that kind of change that you know, somebody dies in your family and you're forced to change because it was yeah. your wife or something like that. So we, it's funny, Gary, because we don't think about change as a positive thing always. You know, we think about change as a positive thing when we're looking to lose some pounds or we're looking to gain some muscle or we're looking to eat better. We see it as positive. And this sometimes when we bring these things in, we might see it as positive, but our people might not see it as positive change. So, you know, from a leadership mm. perspective, we have to really understand what it is we're changing and how we're going to change it. And Craig and his team, at, this is at Autoflow, we always talk about this, like, let's eat the elephant one bite at a time. So let's let that shop owner adopt a little piece of technology as they can in bite-sized chunks. And eventually within a year or two years, you'll transform your shop and you'll transform your customer experience and you'll transform everything, your bottom line to your you know, average repair or everything, right? We don't try and throw everything at you and, and eat the elephant one bite at a time because it's just not possible. So it's a great question, Gary. And it all drives once again on the fear of change. Yeah. That fear of change can stop a lot of people. And it's understandable. Absolutely stop them. Uh, or when they start putting this in place, they get the pushback, right? Absolutely. And all of a sudden, the owner's knees buckle and, ah, this is not going to work. No, right? Gary, I'll, I'll tell you one of the book recommendations that Chris put in front of our team a long time ago is called Change or Die. And the author also acknowledges the title's a little over the top, but he gets it. But Change and Thrive is the right. goal. But there's three keys to effective change. <laughs> In that book by Alan Deutschman, he says, relate, repeat, reframe. And relate is the first piece. A relate is the piece that most people skip. They just often shop owners will just drop a new thing right in front of their team. Say, okay, guys, we're doing it this way now. And has failed mm -hmm. to relate why it's important, inspire his team, and instill any sense of hope that it's a brighter future that this change is going to bring. And you get immediate objections because when you give a technician who's very efficient with his existing process, mm -hmm. it will feel very awkward at first. He needs to know the big picture uh, and probably does not have the frames in which to uh, put himself to facilitate the next moves. So we hope to wipe out fear by slowly moving into the technology side of the digital world in the shop, not all one big bang. That's an easy way to put it. Yeah. When we're dealing with yeah. this, Gary, it's, it's not, we don't expect shop owners to come into their ownership. A lot of them were technicians themselves and now they're, they were sole proprietors perhaps for a little while. And then they grew their facilities and uh, became the owner and leader of a team. And that doesn't automatically make you excellent at onboarding new systems and procedures. It's not a skill set that happens unless it's something you practice. Now, the cool thing is our team supports them on this part 
of the process. We don't expect yeah. you to be masters at organizing how the rollout's going to occur. And it's important to understand that uh, auto flow, the key difference here for us is that we invest the time in making sure it will be successful for individuals. We don't leave them alone. Good. All right. Thanks for sharing in that segment about old fear, how it gets in our way. You know, here's another segment. I always kind of scratch my head and think about what, what can I ask these guys that, that you want to hear as a shop owner? And you think about it, we, we talk about the go for auto flow and then it gives you better communication. And there's all types of communication going on in, in the shop or not going on in the shop, right? And that needs to be going on. And so, Craig, if you will, is there two or three types of communication that this will help with? or Absolutely. improve. So no, what are no. they? Well, look at it this way, Gary. I, I think there are three types of communication that you have. And at functioning as a service advisor in a facility, uh, I realized very quickly, I'm in the middle of the client, the technician, and and that's a tough spot to be. So I, I'm, I'm that. At that's variable. sort of like the armpit. You're the armpit, right? It, it's, a, it's a tough spot. And I ask this question <laughs> of other guys who I've, I've been a technician most of my career as well. And when I ask other people who've done both roles, which one's more stressful? Universally, it's, oh yeah, service advising. Absolutely. Now, the, yeah. the third element of this uh, that I wanted to say too, is I'm between the technicians and the clients, but then I have my family. And I'll tell you this, at the most stressful point in my career, I would go home at the end of my day and I've got no words left in me for my wife and my kids. And I'm fried. I'm burnt out. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of people experience this on a regular basis. And it's usually stemming from poor communication in a facility in all directions. And when you have to be the single source of all those corrections, that gets real tough for any individual. I meet people sometimes too. I'll say, hey, when when does your eye twitch come in <laughs> during the week when they have similar roles like that where they're one advisor to a few technicians, a yeah. uh, few too many technicians, I should say. And it's like, oh yeah, it's usually about, you know, Thursday or whatever. So that's good. Mine was Monday. <laughs> <laughs> but no, digital yeah. solutions help with the communication in all directions through status updates by text message, through simple okay. status updates internally that technicians can see by understanding and engaging with a digital workflow. It doesn't even need to send a message. They can simply look and see. With automated updates, it's it's brilliant. And and by, by all means, by the time a day is done with proper workflow, I do have words <laughs> for my family when I get home. It's beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, that third leg of the communication is what do I do when I leave here? Am I just spent, spent. or am I still valuable to somebody? And you must right? see this all the time too, Gary, with yeah. the owners or advisors alike. Yeah, that's why service advisor training never worked in the evening. Okay, because <laughs> <You're right>. most <laughs> everybody showed up for the training classes and were just, they were just mind dead, okay, at that yes. point. They yeah. couldn't even think about it. And that's why we do our training from 11 to three during the day because they're still they're still progressing there chris and, anything you'd like to add yeah here? gary in a world where you feel like you're being over communicated to and and if you think about it we're being bombarded by marketing messages we're being bombarded by commercials we're being bombarded by our phones constantly your customers truly do appreciate when the communication is pertinent to their lives when their car's okay. in the shop it's important and we know this as auto repair shop owners, like, yeah, I can get a million different messages from a million different people. But when, you know, I'm worried about how I'm going to get to work tomorrow and I'm worried about how to get my kid to soccer practice and all those things like that communication becomes ever so important to this whole relationship between a customer and a shop owner. And I think internally as well, like Craig alluded to, when everybody's on the same page in the shop, things much move much quicker through the shop. Yeah. And, and we have yeah. to remember that, right? Like part of our job is to serve the community and serve it well. And by being efficient and getting that job done quickly and getting Gary Gunn's car back to him quickly so he can go to this important business meeting is part of that service that we're providing, right? That transportation piece is important to many people. So that communication, a lot, a lot of times people think, oh, I don't really need to communicate to my customer this way. I say, mm -hmm. yeah, you do. You you owe it to them to almost over communicate to them because I'm telling you, it's not over communication to them. It's, it's important communication to yes. them. Yes, 
Yeah. And that's the difference between the millions of imp- pieces of, you know, messages we get on our phones all day versus, oh, I actually really care about this one thing. Yeah. Gary, what yeah. Chris said is spot on because I, I see this a lot when I'm working with advisors that are new to this, especially when we're talking about automatic text updates on key statuses. It's it's funny from the check-in status to inspection, for example, we can customize this where you can send an update to a client when the inspection begins on the vehicle and some service advisors, do you think that makes them a little nervous? It does. And here's why they say to me this on a regular basis, they say, well, Craig, what, what happens if they get that text and that car has been here for four hours? Uh, I said, they're going to get a timely update on when the inspection begins. (laughs) And it would be true. (laughs) Uh, What were you going to tell them? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and that's yeah. it, it's like sort of a, an aha moment for a lot of guys that I meet. It's like, oh yeah, so you know when I know this is actually happening, that forces me to set more realistic expectations too, which is better for the relationship overall. And now we're actually moving in the right direction. Otherwise, if you have systems that are supposed to kind of adapt to inefficiencies, well, that's exactly what your systems will do is they will continue to adapt to those inefficiencies and mm-hmm. probably cause a number of chaotic elements. And Gary, when the program was created, it wasn't created so we could text message customers. Although it was called auto text me at the beginning, the whole idea was the workflow. It was the shared responsibility in a shop. So everybody's on the same page. Everybody's on the same page. Then communication like Craig just alluded to can happen effectively and efficiently. Get on the same page. Good. Yes. Well, good. Good for this segment. That that word communication is huge. And I like the three examples you gave there, Craig. And if you didn't hear it, folks, just go back again and listen, because it was there's gold right here in this segment. Thank you. Here's another segment. I'm not going to scratch my head because I've taken all the hair off my head anyway, so I won't do that again. But I was listening to the last segment and Chris and Craig were sharing their massive knowledge and and what happens in a shop environment. And there's something I've always heard, efficiency efficiency equals productivity, Chris. Is that true or is that just a myth? Efficiency equals productivity. I, I It's absolutely true. And, and having a tool that helps you manage, like we were just talking about this last segment, having something that allows everybody to be on the same page. Everybody has a shared sense of responsibility when it comes to that car and the timeline of that vehicle when it's under your care. Everybody mm-hmm. has a job to do. And a lot of times we forget that, right? We forget we're, we're part of this bigger cohesive unit. It's like, no, I'm the technician. I do this. I'm the service writer. I do this. I'm the porter. I do this versus no, once again, we're really here to take care of this vehicle and there's multiple touch points. So who's in, in with sharing this responsibility and whose responsibility for it and seeing who's on that task at any given point in time truly does create more of an effective and more productive environment. Whereas before, Gary, you know, when I came into this industry, before I was a shop owner, it was a set of keys. And that key went yeah. with the clipboard and that clipboard could go anywhere and everywhere, and it did. And sometimes yeah. that clipboard ended up laying on the passenger seat of the vehicle. And at 5.30, I'd walk out and i go, uh, mm-hmm. what's that vehicle? And because the technician parked it, and we were supposed to talk to a customer yeah. about this thing, and we didn't. And it's still sitting there, and that clipboard's still sitting there. And like Craig said in the last segment, too, are you going to be transparent? Tell them. Hey, Gary, sorry, uh, we lost your car about three hours ago, and it's been sitting <laughs> in the parking lot. So with something yeah. in this digital realm, and, and a lot of tools are out there that help you, once again, manage this digital process, but it's really about managing this car through this workflow of shared responsibility, which absolutely makes your shop more effective and productive. Yeah, responsibility assignment's a big thing. Uh, and digitally, think about this. Uh, Chris mentioned clipboards, and clipboards will st- probably still exist for a long, long time. I'd, absolutely. I'd, Don't disagree with reinforcing things with a slip of paper, but here's what digital things can do. Uh, Question here for you, true or false? Priorities change in an auto repair shop from time to time. (laughs) Probably by minute by minute. Every once in a while. (laughs) Every once in a Uh, while. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. Absolutely right. So think of it this way. Uh, And digital systems are excellent for this. I mean, simple drag and drop priority rearrangements are a thing. 
And so if you had to wander into the shop and flip paper in different order every time priority changes, how well are we communicating these changes? What if you could on your screen and it was updated on a technician's tablet or workstation, uh, you saw real time updates as necessary? And mm. what if you are more able to see on that screen who's doing what and next? I'll tell you this. My dad had a wonderful quote. Uh, which he taught me and my brother years and years ago when we were young managers in our, our transmission shop. He said, technicians work better when they are preloaded. What's that mean? It means when they have the knowledge of which three to four cars up to that amount that they're responsible for next, they magically, uh, the, the technicians are the most efficiency-driven people on the planet. They want to do things naturally the most efficient way possible. So if they know what they're doing next, they cognate all the things. They have the tools organized the way they need to as they imagine doing the next thing and they magically get it done in the time frame that you wish them to get it done in, in many cases. <laughs> yeah. It, it's not always the technician that causes the breakdown of a productivity no. in the shop. And, and like I said a minute ago, a lot of times it's the front end. And what I'm hearing with Autoflow is that you're marrying those two together and you're now kind of getting all the wrinkles out of it. So it will flow. Absolutely. Right? There you go. And sometimes it's the part yeah. company, Gary. But, but are you tracking how long the part's been or how long you've been waiting for it? I mean, just simple things like that, who it's coming from, how long you've been waiting for it, what will the estimated time of arrival for it these things are helpful sure. because like craig said i mean how many i'm going to ask a question and, it, and it's a it's a craig question how many times does a, a day does a part not get delivered on time or is wrong like well that's not <laughs> let's leave the wrong out of here but not delivered on time like does that happen yeah. once a day does that happen five times a day 10 times a day happens often. We know that, right? So yeah. once again, having something that not just everybody internally is sharing responsibility, but you can put some boundaries on other people who, who share in that responsibility yeah. of getting that car done. So there's external people really in that flow. You can, you can put external people in you there, know. measure them too. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Workflow hey, team segment. sport. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So we're back to, I'm going to check my notes, go for auto flow. And this time we want to talk about a customer that comes through the door, calls on the phone. Uh, perhaps uh, they're called clients. Perhaps they're called, they have an appointment. There's many ways that they can come to your business, right? Just drop in. So how does auto flow, Chris, uh, and we go for that digital, we go for that uh, uh, digital experience in our shop. How does that translate to customer service or customer, let's say not customer service, but customer experience? And Gary, we're touching on some some training topics too. And I love this, right? Because I think what you're alluding to and what we have to all understand, and, and we've kind of we've kind of alluded to this earlier, is that a tool is not going to solve your process problems. Like Craig said, you know, when you get a better wrench, you know, a, 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 it, it should be a little faster than the last wrench. It should be a little bit better. So this digital tool should just enhance your process that's already in place. So communication, we talked about that, right? Transparency and getting pictures with the digital inspection. One of the things I really want to focus on, which me and Craig preach on all the time, is like quality control. You know, it's one of the things that mm. you know, we, we try and preach in our tool and we try and preach as a process just in general because a lot of times, you know, this car, you get all these great updates, you get the digital inspection, the work gets done. And then on the back end, you know, is you, you making sure that you're returning Gary's car in a better shape that it came in, that the tools have been removed, that any grease pins have been wiped, that the lights have been reset, that the stickers have been done. So we have parts in here in the tool to make sure that you're adhering to the processes. And then there's a lot of reports on making sure you as an owner can really look at what your team is doing to create that better customer experience. But I'm gonna put it on the owner here and I'm gonna put on the processes that the owner puts in place. And what we do mm -hmm. is we allow you to bring this tool in or multiple tools, because there's multiple facets to Autoflow to enhance this experience as the owner wants that experience or that journey that they want the customer to go through when they come into their shop. And in my shop, I absolutely do, Gary. I want that customer to get the text message on the appointment up front 
the reminder that their appointment is coming. I want them to get a text message when the vehicle is getting checked in. I want them to get a text message when they're working on the vehicle. I want a personalized phone call when we're talking about, hey, Gary, we found these things on your vehicle. We'd like you to, you know, organize these and prioritize these. I'd like them to also get that, you know, digital quality control inspection that says, hey, Gary, we've gone through, we fixed everything and your car's in good shape. And then I'd like them to get that follow up. Hey, Gary, did you really enjoy the journey you just went through at our shop? And would you leave us the five-star review? A lot of times, you know, we're all worried about that five-star review, but are you actually taking, and like you said, guest experience, are you taking that customer yeah. through the journey that you want that customer to experience in your shop? And I believe that our tool has a lot of aspects or facets to allow for this journey to take place. Chris said something uh, that I want to draw attention to very, very specifically, the personalized phone call. We talk about texting, we talk about automated status updates, but both Chris and I would also agree that you cannot automate a relationship. That personalized phone call is a key component of a process. And right. we talked about fear in a previous segment. Fear, one of them I see in shop owners is actually a a misconception, a presupposition, if you will, that texting is going to replace my conversations. And I don't like that. And you shouldn't. They are not meant right. to replace a conversation. I text my wife all the time. We have glorious conversations. We text the trivial things to stage a phone call in many cases. And this is where I run into mm -hmm. something that, and a phrase I've used, uh, it was, I forget, I was probably in a brainstorm with Chris when this came out, uh, is don't communicate from your own pocket. Sometimes we project onto others how we want to be communicated to and our presuppositions come into play, but you have to look at the science. J.D. Power has studied this five years in the aftermarket and it is, uh, the verdict is out. Clients prefer text message status updates. They've proven yes. it for us. We don't have to try to convince people of it anymore. There's other groups studying it. <laughs> and five years in a row, Christian Brothers has won. Uh, they're, they're wonderful at emphasizing the communication and treat the guests with respect during that entire part of the process. It's, it's a model to uh, aspire to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, great segment. Anything else you'd like to add before we close that out? You know, sometimes folks in these segments, I ask some really stupid questions because I don't really know the answer. So I'm going to pose one to Chris and Craig about efficiency versus effectiveness. Now, in the go for auto flow segment here, does it does it really prove both or one stand out over the other? So, Chris. You raised your hand to uh, to take this on first, and then Craig said he had some more thoughts on that. So, Chris, what, what would you say to that? That is a mind blowing question, Gary, and it's not a dumb one. It's 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 awesome, uh, effective or efficient. So when I think of the word efficiency, I think about speed of service, going back to how quickly I can deliver something, and how quickly I can get the customer back to Gary. If it's or the car back to Gary, I think of effectiveness as have I done my job to the nth degree? Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily mm -hmm. see them together. I see them if they are together, they're wonderful. But I can see very effective people taking a lot of time doing something. And I can see very efficient people doing something very quickly. I could see very effective and efficient people doing something very thoroughly and quickly. And I think a lot of times we get caught up in efficiency and we might gloss over things. Is there a way to do things effective and efficiently? Absolutely. Are there, what is it? The competence, unconscious, the competence, consciousness, there's a term for it, right? That we go over time, we become very good at doing the same thing over and over again because our subconscious takes over and we still do it at a very high level and a very effective level. Mm -hmm. So I love that. Can we be, can this tool help you be effective and efficient? Absolutely. Is it possible that you're just a very effective shop? And I know effective shops that aren't necessarily the fastest in the world. And I know very efficient shops that are not necessarily the most, their, their, their jobs mm -hmm. are not always uh, to the nth degree. But great yeah. question, Gary. I, I love it. That's my it, opinion on effective versus efficient. It's, Craig. it's a good question. It's a good question. And here's, here's my experience with it. 
when my brother and I first started working on digital inspections in our shop as a core component of, of, of a digital process, we took it to a degree that it was never intended to go to as transmission professionals. We had started devising sheets before we even started doing digital inspections at all. We were building sheets that were inspections for each specific type of transmission model at the time. Four speeds were ubiquitous. So 4L60Es, A604s, uh, 4R70s, and all the likes. And so we had a separate inspection sheet and it was down to the level of detail that only a transmission expert would do. It was going to be effective, we thought. <laughs> It wasn't even remotely close because it lacked some core components of efficiency and our newness to uh, technology in that case. Now, fast forward to today where shops are doing courtesy inspections. I see a funny thing happen where technicians who have been doing paper inspections for years are now confronted with a digital inspection for the first time. And they yeah. think in their mind that what's being asked of them is to diagnose every one of those line items. And just because they're holding uh, an electronic device, they 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 themselves, through no direction from the shop, believe that they're supposed to diagnose all of these things for free. Like marking it bad on a digital inspection immediately re requires you to go and look at all of the reasons why it could be bad and find mm -hmm. out why, like as a courtesy. Now, of course, who wouldn't rebel against something like that, right? This is understandable because it wouldn't be efficient at all. So I have to teach them all the time that, you know what, guys, a simple note here, you can mark it red and your recommendation would be further assessment. Pretty neat, huh? That's efficient. Yeah, yeah. And it gives the service advisor an opportunity to sell more work. Now, does it, do you figure out the problem right away? No, and you shouldn't. But now you have given the service advisor the information he needs to be able to sell more work, which will be billed and therefore will make you a more productive and efficient employee. Wow. You know what? I, I thought this question would fall flat, but you guys made it sound so huge. And uh, we went all the way from A to Z in the alphabet, right? Yeah, the School of Hard Knocks teaches you a lot of things on stuff like that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thanks for this segment, man. It's been good. Folks, if you've listened to all these segments, thank you for staying long enough to hear sort of the conclusion or putting that bow on that particular process we're talking about. And you've always heard me talk about it. If you let the processes and the systems do all the work, you'll leave the shop full of energy. If you try to pull everything through yourself and you just ramrod it and pull it and jerk it and move it through and you push all day long and the systems and processes don't run your shop, but you do, you'll be tired, worn out, and by age 50, you're done. You're toast, you're out of here, and you want to go do something else in life. So as a closeout here, Chris, what are maybe a few morsels of things during the segments or something that might have come up? So let's let's wrap this up. I want to go back to the fear of change, and and I want to just encourage, I'm a shop owner, I get it, change is hard. Change is, is but it always, typically, we end up on the better side of change. I, I love the analogy of, you know, when you work out and you're trying to build muscle, what do you do to that muscle when you start lifting weights? You're tearing it apart. You're ripping it up. Yeah. Then when it rebuilds, it rebuilds a little bit bigger. Every time you've tear it apart, you're really, it's a little bit bigger each time. And, you know, and eventually you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think as shop owners, we need to realize that's where we grow is when we implement effective change. I'm not saying go run out and chase every new great idea, but an idea like this and something like a digital transformation is here. It's established. It's here to stay. Think of it like working out. Do you want to be Arnold? I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So go for Arnold, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> reference in there somewhere. I don't know. I, you know, I've, I've been reading a, a little bit about him. He just put out a book. So be useful. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Everybody book, writes a book. You know, everybody, everybody writes, writes a book. Yeah. I'm you might, as well, might as well get one out yourself. If so, Greg, how would Arnold's. you like to put a bow on this for us? But you know, I, I'm going to build on what Chris said. There is, a, if you want a good book recommendation, too, the one that truly has actually changed my life is uh, "Comfort Crisis" by Michael Easter. 
And there's a lot in there about how we've become very comfortable as people in the world today. And that, well, basically in comfort's not where growth happens. So if you are uncomfortable mm -hmm. with digital processes and this move, I say good. And I'm also going to say you're not alone. And I'm also going to remind you that that's why our team is here. If you want to move into a digital process and you want some expert opinions and advice and guidance along the way, we can teach you. And you might find that your quality of life is greatly improved by pushing through something that seems hard, but it just makes you stronger. Yeah. I want to go back to the beginning. I asked this question to our illustrious panel here. Uh, why does an auto shop owner need to take a serious look at auto flow? I know the answer. Okay. Now I know. I didn't know when we started. If you haven't started this in your business, why are you waiting? So reach out. And on the screen, you'll see some contact information. Reach out to Autoflow. Find out if it's a fit for you. The only way you're going to know is try the shoe on. Take a look at it and, and find out. It may scare the living heck out of you. But you may fall in love with it, and it may do what you want it to do. So that is our uh, showcase today, and I want to thank Chris and Craig for sharing their wit and wisdom. And uh, next time, we'll probably do it in the backyard in our lawn chairs. How's that? Nice. So thank Thanks, you all Gary. for being here at Showcase. Like and subscribe to Auto Shop Showcase on YouTube and your favorite podcasting platform. Visit autoshopshowcase.com to sign up for monthly mentoring with Gary Gunn.